Good afternoon. My name is Ralph Parker, and I am the Senior Manager for DART Transit Center Services. And we're here to talk about DART Zoom, a new bus network. DART is redesigning its bus network to better serve your North Texas community, and we welcome audience participation. I'm going to also encourage everybody to complete our survey at dartzoom.org. We have a great panel of uh, experts to talk to you guys today. So I'm going to start with uh, Rob and then Lawrence and then uh, Michelle could back clean up for us. If you all will uh, introduce yourselves, please. Thank you, Ralph. And I'm Rob Smith and I'm the AVP of Service Planning and Scheduling for DART. This project aims to completely rethink the design of DART's bus service. We've made many incremental changes to the bus system over the years and even some big adjustments like our December 2010 service change. Yet many of our bus routes have remained more or less the same for decades, while the community we serve has changed dramatically. Our goal is to design bus services that reflect these changes, leading to a major bus service restructuring that would happen in 2022. We've hired Jarrett Walker and Associates to help us with this redesign. JWA has worked on bus redesign projects throughout the United States, including relatively recent work in Houston that reimagined their bus service. Michelle is their project manager for this effort, and she'll give you a presentation today that highlights more details, and we'll also have opportunities to open up for questions. Our work on the development of the plan is really divided into three phases. The first phase, has included a review of our current service and develop a, of what we've called network concepts that illustrate different service choices. The second phase will design a draft bus network plan informed by input from meetings like this. After review of that draft, the third phase will develop the final bus network plan, which will ultimately go to the DART Board of Directors for consideration. Again, thanks to all of you for participating. And that uh, I'll turn it over to Lawrence. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Ralph and Rob. My name is Lawrence Meshack from DART Community Affairs. We've been working uh, proactively with the team, with Jared Walker and service planning to facilitate this process. So we're happy to be a part of it. We're uh, fully in ingrained in trying to get input uh, from many sources. So we look forward to continued involvement. And with that, I will pass it to Michelle. Thanks so much, Lawrence. Uh, my name is Michelle Poirot. I appreciate the introduction, uh, Rob. Rob explained that my firm, which is called Jarrett Walker and Associates, is a, a transit planning firm and we specialize in designing bus networks. And this is something that I personally have worked on in a lot of US cities like Indianapolis and Richmond, Virginia, um, Anchorage, Alaska, and also Houston, Texas. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a specialty, so we don't do everything. I think people might today have some questions about other things like rail or fares or transit center design. That's not something I'm an expert in. Um, but I love to talk about the ways that all those decisions can support a successful bus network. So I'm managing this project and working with Lawrence and Ralph and Rob, as well as a local team of experts to design a new bus network for DART and also consult existing bus riders and consult the public and other stakeholders on how DART should design its new bus network. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Lawrence. And thank you, Rob. Uh, we are going to take some questions uh, towards the end of our, our presentation here today. Uh, so we always encourage you to, if you have some questions, please make sure that you uh, type them to us. And uh, before we do that, we did get some questions in advance of the Facebook Live event. And I'm going to start by uh, giving those questions out to the panel. But if you have additional questions outside of this, you can always go to serviceplanning at dart.org, and we will be more than happy to answer your questions there as well. So I want to start with the first question, and Rob, this is for you. Why is it necessary for Dart to redesign its entire bus network, and why now? The community has been changing and evolving pretty dramatically. Well, we've basically focused on making changes to bus network to match the growth of the rail system. But we have had a lot of interest in relooking the bus system to make service more direct, 
to make service more frequent. We have introduced some changes to the buses already over the past couple of years. And so we really want to step back and look at the entire system, parts of it that are working, things that we can do to make it more effective, to make it better for our customers, and hopefully over time to improve ridership. All right, awesome. Thank you, Rob. Um, Michelle, what are the goals for redesigning a bus network? And do any of those goals compete? Yeah, that's a great question, whoever asked it. Um, so I will tell you, there's a goal for the process that I want to make clear, um, which is different from the goal for the actual bus network design itself. For this process, this, this process where DART explores ideas, shares ideas with people, and then makes a decision about what to do, um, it's really important that, first of all, we engage existing transit riders um, and, and ask them what's important to them in terms of changes to the system. Uh, it's important that we engage all of the 13 cities that belong to DART and um, the people in those cities and also the staff who work hard to make those cities successful. And, um, and then finally, we, a really important goal for us in this process is that people understand why the final plan is what it is. So in a big project like this, where you're changing you know, potentially everything, at the end of it, I don't think there's going to be a plan that, that anyone necessarily says is perfect for them. It's just exactly what they wanted. But our goal is that everyone understands why the plan is what it is. And a lot of people like it, um, but it may not still be perfect for them, but they can see why certain compromises were made. They understand why they got most of what they want, but not everything they want because other people in their community need something different. Um, so there are these conflicting goals for transit, which is why you can't make a plan that's perfect for everyone all at the same time. Um, you, um, you know, if you want a transit network to maximize ridership, to get as many people as possible through the doors of the buses and trains, you would design it a little bit more the way a business would do its business plans. You would put your best service that people find most useful where you have the most potential customers. So you'd put it in the places where there are lots of people living, lots of people traveling, lots of activity and jobs close to bus stops. But that's not the same as being there for everyone. And one of the goals of transit is to be there for everyone as like a form of insurance and inclusion, to be fair in a way that people have access to transit no matter where they live. So that even if they live in a place without very many other people, or they live far from a place that a bus stop could be practically located, they still have some service nearby. And that's another goal for transit, but it's different from a goal of getting high ridership. So these two goals trade off against each other, getting higher ridership or spreading service out so that we've got a little bit of service close to everybody. That's a really difficult trade off that we'll address in this project. Fantastic, thank you, Michelle. Uh, Lawrence, I'm gonna to come to you in just a second, but Rob, I wanna to touch on uh, something that's going on for everyone right now. Uh, how will the COVID-19 pandemic impact arts redesign on its bus network? Obviously, we are in a different world right now and not where we expected to be. And some of the rules for us have changed with social distancing and making sure that people are as safe as possible. And our bus ridership has dropped about 55 to 60% during the pandemic. So we have made some temporary changes to reduce overall service on both buses and trains. We're actually using some of the information that we've developed during the early parts of the study to guide some of the work that we're doing. And we're gonna be making adjustments as people begin to go back to work and the ridership we expect will slowly grow. It won't all come back right away. And there may be some people who are able to permanently work at home or have other travel arrangements. And so, we will be watching carefully what's happening in terms of ridership, the changes in the system, and adjusting accordingly both our service 
and how we look to design the ultimate bus network that we will be seeing in 2022. Thank you, Rob. And, and Michelle, if you could expand on that just for a second from uh, from the Jarrett Walker and Associates point of view with transit uh, during this pandemic, uh, what are some of the things that you all think about and how does it modify the work that you guys do on the uh, planning consulting end? Well, in the near term, meaning in the next couple months, we are helping agencies roll out uh, service plans that respond to COVID. And we have been helping agencies. And that kind of planning, it's a little bit like opposite day for transit planners because, um, you know, we've been helping agencies for years figure out how to run more service that's really popular and have full buses because that's really efficient. And that means that for their budget, they're getting lots and lots of people where they need to go. And now they're trying to figure out how to run buses that are half empty um, and you know how to run service that is useful and there for people who need to travel because the people who need to travel right now are keeping the rest of us alive and fed. Um, and yet not so popular that the buses fill up or they're, they're deploying a lot more buses on some lines. I know DART is doing this to make sure that they're giving people adequate space and they're giving their bus operators adequate space within the buses. Um, so that's a completely new challenge. It's interesting, of course, it's unfortunate, um, but that's very short term. Um, in terms of the long term, you know, once, once we're planning for a time when probably our health situation is close to normal again. I'm very hopeful of that. Um, this doesn't really change the fundamental trade-offs and the fundamental issues. There's still a choice of whether a transit agency, you know, spreads its service out to get a little bit close to everyone, but therefore doesn't offer great service on any one line or concentrates on a network that it can offer a very high level of service on where there are lots and lots of people, that choice is still going to exist. Um, so in the long term, this doesn't change the big trade-off that we're presenting right now to people about what to do in the DART network, even though in the next couple of months and maybe the next year, it certainly does present some challenges and DART is, is innovating and, and figuring out how to address those right now. Thank you, Michelle, very much. Lawrence, can you give us more information about the survey and how long will it be open for responses? Uh, yes, sir. Just generally speaking, um, the survey can be accessed by going to dartzoom.org. It is what I consider a classic type survey. It asks a lot of information about the demographics, about your demographic, whoever is uh, taking the survey. Uh, there are some transit uh, related questions, of course. In that survey, your 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 travel patterns, your your personal uh, daily habits, things like that. So it's a typical typical valid survey in terms of um, what uh, most most entities have um, developed over the years, and I think it's a uh, very nice uh, uh, instrument to undertake. So I would encourage you to when you're comfortable to go ahead and take that. That uh, survey will be uh, available through mid June. Uh, June 14th, I believe, is the cutoff date. All right. Thank you, Lawrence, for that. Yeah. And it's oh, go ahead, Michelle. There are going to be um, ads for that survey posted on the buses pretty soon. So if you, you know, anyone who's listening, if you know people who ride, uh, let them know, keep their eye out. Um, they can either go to the website or they can keep their eye out for an ad on the buses because we, we want to make sure to reach existing riders with this survey as well. Absolutely. And if you are listening to us today, we do encourage you to ask questions during this Facebook live session, as well as going to dartzoom.org to take that survey. And the other thing as well is that we want to make sure that if you have additional questions after this, you can always, of course, go to service planning at dart.org. We're here with Rob Smith, Lawrence Meshack, Michelle Poirot, and we are talking about DART Zoom, um, our new bus network. So we're gonna continue with some of the questions we took before the Facebook Live event started. And Michelle, I'm gonna start with you here for this one. When redesigning a bus network, what are some of the considerations? Mm. Well, we always start with as much data as we can about the existing world. 
So that means uh, data about where people live. We want to know where the residents are, where there are residents who are living at high numbers, um, where residents of color are living, because we're careful um, to respect civil rights law and justice. Um, also where lower income people are living, and that's both because lower income people often have a more severe need for transit, but also because they're, um, they're great customers for transit. So even if you decide you really wanna pursue high ridership transit, uh, lower income people have an incentive to be your customer. Um, so we're looking for particular groups of people. We also look at where young people live um, and seniors. Um, then we look at where jobs are. We wanna know um, where all the jobs are, where are their jobs that are really quite dense so that if you drive a bus past that place and you stop that bus, there's lots of jobs reachable within a short walk. Um, and we're attentive to the, the environment, to the landscape. You know, Maybe there are lots and lots of jobs nearby, but they're actually on the other side of the freeway, or maybe they're on the other side of a railroad track. And we know that that's not actually nearby. And um, another thing that we look at about the landscape is um, walkability. Are there sidewalks in this area? Um, can the roads be crossed so people can reach a bus stop on both sides? Or are they stuck using the bus stop only on their side and it's hard to get home when they come back? Um, there are some very local things that are hard for us as the national experts to know by ourselves, but we always do network planning with the local experts in the room. So the two network concepts that people see today that we're asking people about, we didn't design by ourselves. We worked with Rob and we worked with a bunch of other DART staff, Ralph, and we worked with uh, city planners. So all 13 of the DART cities sent planners to join us and actually do the work of drawing those routes on those concept maps because they really know where is it not safe to walk? Where are there a lot of people who currently ride transit today? Um, where is a socially important destination? Uh, things like that. So that's the local knowledge that's really essential that we don't bring but we make sure to get the people with that knowledge to the table when we do work uh, in North Texas. Thank you, Michelle. Rob, what are, would DART consider taking a ridership focus in one city and a coverage approach in another? That'll be a decision ultimately that our board of directors will make, but absolutely it may be that we end up with a mixed approach where uh, conventional fixed route service works in higher density, higher activity. I think we, uh, I think Rob may have froze up. There. And we'll be looking at that throughout. Okay. May I add something? Yes, please. Um, something that I think is interesting about these two concepts is that if, if anyone from any of the 13 cities asked me, and they have, um, which concept is better for my city, I don't have an answer. Because you can see this trade-off between focusing on more frequent routes where the most potential riders are or covering lots of places, you can actually see this trade off in every single city. Um, so every city in the high ridership concept will see more frequencies, better frequency, um, maybe more weekend service, more night service, all day service, but fewer places covered, longer walks to service. And then in the high coverage concept, every city sees more routes covering more places, but worse frequencies, um, maybe not as long of hours of service, maybe not as much weekend service. So this trade-off exists in every single city. So I, you know, but as Rob says, it's up to the board um, to decide how to, how to balance these goals and whether to balance them city by city or across the whole service area. But it's really a choice that's real for every city. Uh, you can't simply say that, you know, one city would obviously want this concept and the other would obviously want that concept. I haven't, I haven't seen that happen. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Lawrence, how are you finding out what is important to individual cities and their residents? Well, as Michelle indicated, uh, there's already been a team <clears throat> that has met with uh, representatives of all the 13 cities. Um, we're also, you know, facilitating that as much as we can with staff 
uh, staff liaisons to um, the various cities. We have uh, meetings with them uh, normally. So any mechanism that these cities can suggest that we assist with facilitating that, we're undertaking that and implementing that in the plan. So it's an ongoing process and we look forward to continued work uh, with the cities and many other municipal staff as it uh, applies to, uh, to Dart Zoom and this process. All right, thanks Lawrence. And I wanna follow up because we just got a question from Derek on Facebook and, and I believe you touched on some of these things, but how do you feel at this point that riders are aware of the upcoming changes and uh, felt included in the process? Well, the changes haven't taken place yet. They won't take place until 2022, of course. We're at the first phase. So we're at the input gathering um, point, if you will. So there are plenty of opportunities for him to participate. Um, we've had a number of webinars and town hall meetings. Thus far, we're gonna have more of them. Uh, we've conducted some of those in Spanish. Uh, we're gonna do whatever we can to uh, facilitate any language barrier uh, issues that may come up. So as Michelle said, there are going to be some ads on the buses. There are going to be some more uh, information going out, but I would encourage him to go to the website and uh, take the survey, of course, then look at all the other opportunities that uh, the public has to participate in the process. And of course, he needs to share that. Derek needs to share that with uh, any other rider or customer or potential customer that he uh, encounters. And so we can get that input and put it into the mix. So it'll be counted as part of the uh, overall testimony or testament to this, uh, to Dart Zoom. Fantastic, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Michelle, are there other cities, and, and we talked about this a little bit uh, at the beginning, but if you could talk about some of the other cities that have gone through a similar process that Dart is going through now, and what can we learn from their experiences? Sure. Um, well, we went through this in pretty recently. Uh, we led the city of Richmond, Virginia through this. And, um, you know, every, every city we've done this in, or I should say every region we've done this in, uh, turns out a little differently. So it's hard for me to know, you know, if, if Dallas, the Dallas area experience will be more like Richmond or more like Indianapolis or more like Houston, but I'll just tell you a little, little couple of highlights. Um, so one thing that happened in Richmond is there was a, a decision by the Richmond City Council to um, make that trade-off between higher frequencies and wider coverage differently in different parts of the city. Um, so, you know, referring to that earlier question, um, that is possible. That is something they decided to do in Richmond. There was a neighborhood that preferred shorter walks to a bus route and was okay with having to wait longer for the bus um, as a result. So in that part of the city, there were bus routes close together, but every bus route came every 30 minutes. In other parts of the city, the bus routes were a little farther apart, but they came every 10 or 15 minutes. Um, uh, Richmond decided to make a shift towards higher ridership and higher frequencies overall, and they did get an increase in ridership as a result. Um, but it was hard. It was certainly was a, was a hard process. Uh, Indianapolis decided they wanted to shift towards higher ridership, but they were not willing to cut any existing coverage, meaning they didn't want to take away a bus route in an area where anyone rides today, rode today back then. Um, even if it was just a small number of people, they said, we, we just can't bring ourselves to do it. And so what they did is instead of using only the budget they had where they had to make that trade off, they decided to grow the budget. And so they actually passed an income tax for transit, which is pretty rare a couple years later so that they could invest in higher frequencies, higher ridership routes without having to give up any of that coverage of low density places. Um, Houston, in contrast, then this is many years now ago now, this was 2015, they decided to shift to higher frequencies and higher ridership, but they did not raise new funding for bus, their bus network. So they did have to cut some coverage in order to get 
uh, in order to shift service to those highest ridership routes and increase frequencies there. Um, so there's a real range of ways that, that transit agencies can approach this. And I, I couldn't predict um, what the DART is going to decide to do here. And in fact, no one can predict because we need public input to tell us um, and inform the board's decision. So nothing's decided yet and uh, until, until you take the survey and your, your opinion will then be decided. Absolutely. And thank you, Michelle. And, and speaking of that survey, we encourage everybody to go to dartzoom.org where you can complete that survey. If you have additional questions outside of that, of course, you can go to service planning at dart.org or you can ask us here um, while we're doing this Facebook Live event. And while we're doing that, I want to just reintroduce our panel today. Uh, again, we have Mr. Rob Smith uh, with Dart. We have Lawrence Meshack with DART as well. And then we have Michelle Poirot with Jared Walker and Associates. And this has been a very great discussion so far, very dynamic. Uh, so I appreciate everybody for uh, participating in this Facebook Live today. So uh, we do have some few, few more questions here. And of course, we're taking them live on Facebook, just like we took uh, Derek. So thank you, Derek, for uh, chiming in today as well. So Lawrence, DART recently held a series of online webinars about this project. Where can we watch those and, and find other information? Yes, sir, if you go to the uh, website, um, you should be able to access that, uh, ac access the resource tab on the uh, DART Zoom once you get in there and all of the reports and all of the webinars and the previous uh, factual information can be accessed uh, at that point. All right. Thank you, Lawrence. And Rob, I want to put a two-parter here for you. Um, how soon would DART begin implementing this new plan? And then if you can just go ahead and tag on to that, we got a question from David uh, during this live event. Would fares go up if the changes go uh, into effect? Okay, we'll deal with the first part first. Our plan right now is that we will develop this bus network plan, and we will try and implement as much of it as we can in the early part of 2022. We have three service changes normally each year where we make changes to routes and schedules, and either the January, probably more likely the May change in 2022 is where we would be targeting. I don't expect that we will be doing changes early, although I would note that in the two years prior to our start to work on this study, the board had provided extra dollars for bus frequency improvements, and we made a number of improvements throughout the service area, uh, especially on some of our higher ridership routes. And prior to the pandemic, we were actually seeing gains in ridership uh, especially on weekends on some of those routes where we went to more frequent service. And we have established what we call core frequent routes. Those are routes where we try and provide frequency of service equivalent to what we're providing on the rail network. And uh, we will look at possibly expanding that as a part of this study. But 2022 is our target for what we do. Now to the second question on the fares, we are not looking at changes in fares attached to this project. That's a decision that DART makes separately. Uh, in recent history, we've usually done fare changes every five years or so. There has been discussion about uh, perhaps changing our approach to that uh, in the future. But no, we are not necessarily looking at a fare increase associated with the changes that we implement in 2022. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Michelle, how will this redesign help the reliability of the system? And, and that is to talk about the ability of the buses to stay on schedule. Thanks. Um, we're not Right now, we're not uh, exploring in this phase any questions about reliability with the public. So, you know, we're asking this question about whether DART should prioritize frequency or coverage. 
Um, we may in the next phase have a question related to reliability, but DART has done a lot of good work recently to improve reliability. It's still not perfect, of course, but trust me, compared to other transit agencies, it's, it's pretty good. And most importantly, compared to how reliable it was to drive around the DART area, it's pretty good. Um, you know, people are understandably frustrated when their bus is late or the connection is missed or their bus doesn't show up. Um, but we forget that, um, you know, transit's out there on the roads with all the cars. And my experience in the, in the DART area having meetings is even when people drive, they arrive with all kinds of horror stories about getting delayed or getting stuck um, or road being shut because of an accident. So driving's not that reliable. And as long as transit is in a mixed traffic setting, it's stuck in traffic just like all the cars, um, which is why rail feels really special because we protect it from that congestion. We make it very reliable. Um, you can make buses really reliable if you treat them like rail, if you put them in their own space, if you give them their own crossings. Um, that's not something DART has done yet, although I know that there are conversations about maybe planning that in the future. Um, but DART has done some really good work on reliability in the last couple of years to make transit as reliable as it can be considering that it's in the roads with all the cars like everyone else. And they have rewritten their schedules so that uh, they're more accurate about when the bus is going to arrive and when a connection can be made. Um, but I will say the problem with rewriting schedules for congestion is you're basically saying, we're gonna run our buses reliably slower. And that's not something DART can fix on their own. They can't speed up the buses without a lot of help and leadership from the cities and any other government that manages a road that a DART bus runs down is, is responsible basically for how reliable and fast that bus can run. So, um, DART buses were, until the pandemic, steadily slowing down each year. And DART has prioritized reliability by rewriting the schedules for that slower running time. But of course, that's not great for customers. Um, but so this is something that DART's keep continuing to work on. They've got some projects with a couple of cities to speed up bus service. Um, but I do want to give them props for pretty good work improving reliability recently. And of course, now we know things are different with COVID, but we do expect them eventually to get back to some kind of normal where that reliability will continue to be maintained. And actually to reinforce what Michelle mentioned, uh, with the lighter traffic that we saw in April, we set an all-time record for on-time bus performance. Yes, we did. And yeah. thank you, Rob, for throwing that in. It's just how, how much this is out of DART's control. Mm -hmm. yep. Absolutely. And, and while I understand we are in the first phase of this, uh, I want to address Andrew's question. So I want to throw this out to the group here. If Dallas were to choose a high frequency option, would there be strict enforcement to keep cars and delivery trucks out of bus stops and bus lanes since protected bus lanes aren't coming anytime soon? And I know that's a very early early question to ask where we are in this in this redesign phase, but I think it's something that uh, you know, maybe we can talk about for a couple of minutes. And thank you, Andrew, for I tell you putting the that out there. Other places, um, which is that it's really up to the cities to enforce those zones. So if there's a bus stop, it's the city that has established that as a bus stop and made a no parking zone. If there's a bus lane, it's the city, or if it's a county road, it's the county. If it's a state road, it's the state that establishes that bus lane. And it's their enforcement departments that will enforce it. So for example, New York City um, established some bus lanes in Manhattan, very congested place. Um, painted them bright red, made sure that their buses were running like trains, basically, because they're just moving so many thousands and thousands of people. Um, but it was the city of New York, which is not the same as the transit agency, that did a lot of the enforcement. Um, so it's this is, again, a place where it's really helpful to have a good partnership with the city, and DART does have good partnerships with cities. But any kind of enforcement or even just establishing those bus zones or those bus lanes is going to have to um, ultimately be up to a local jurisdiction that is not DART. Yeah. 
And Ralph, I'd like to add to that from a very different perspective. One of the other things that DART is working on is actually having fewer bus stops. We're reassessing the spacing between bus stops. Our bus stops historically have been very close together. And so we're aiming to make them farther apart. Not everyone has been happy with those changes, I would note, based on the feedback that we've gotten from many riders. But uh, generally, we're trying to make the spacing more appropriate, have fewer bus stops. That work is continuing, and we'll be continuing to look at that route by route throughout the system. Uh, over the next six months or so, and we will have worked our way through most of the system at that point. Thank you, Rob. And I want to go to, we have some great questions coming in here, and, and um, I will keep this thread going, and then we'll kind of shift gears a little bit. But uh, is there anything that DART could do? And this is another question from Andrew. Um, to um, what? Let me ask it this way. What tools does DART have to strong arm uh, the partners it is into making that kind of redesign um, or our just whole network redesign actually effective? And is there anything that we can do to, let's say, work better with, uh, with our cities to uh, make some road space more available uh, for a uh, better frequency for our vehicles? I think DART has to work with the cities. We don't have the ability to strong arm in the way it was described, uh, the cities to work with us. We point out situations, we work with them on trying to solve specific problems, and we'll be investigating down the road opportunities for bus lanes like we have uh, somewhat in downtown Dallas now, and other ways that we can speed up bus service. But it's very much a collaborative, cooperative effort with the DART cities, with TxDOT, and the other uh, people involved in the region in maintaining streets, sidewalks, and the other parts of the system that we use every day. Fantastic, thank you, Rob. I wanna shift gears a little bit. We got another question in here, um, and this one was from David. Thank you, David, for this. Um, Rob, why do some rail stations, or why do some of our rail stations don't have bus connections? Usually, if you see a rail station without a bus connection, it is one of two things. Either it is a relatively low ridership location where there are not many people and not much distribution, or in some situations, it's because there's been an intentional effort to coordinate and concentrate the connections at particular locations where the buses and trains come together. And we do that not only to facilitate the bus to train connections, but also the bus to bus connections. We have a number of customers who don't use the rail and may be transferring between buses. And so the, if we coordinate those at particular locations, it allows for other types of travel and more flexibility in how people use the system. Thank you, Rob. Uh, we got another question in here from Beth. Um, will there ever be any transit on Canton Street? Right now, we don't have any. And that can be for anybody. Uh, Rob, I guess that would be mainly for you. Okay, and I'm trying to clarify, I guess it would be helpful for us to know a little bit more about exactly where that's the exact type of question that we would encourage people to submit to the service planning at dart.org address and what we will generally do when we get a very specific question about service on a street or a part of a street is have the service planner who is responsible for that part of the service area get in touch with the person, customer, non-customer directly to talk in more detail about that situation. Thank you, Rob. And Beth, thank you for asking that question on our Facebook Live event today. If you want to follow up, and we encourage you to follow up with us so we can get the appropriate service planner for you to really address what you're asking here, you'd always go to serviceplanning at dart.org. 
You can also go to our website, dartzoom.org, if you haven't, uh, to complete our survey. And I would like to encourage everyone to, of course, go to our website, dartzoom.org, and you can really take a look at what's on that site. It's a great website. Um, you can also take our survey there because we really do appreciate this feedback because we are rede redesigning this network for you, um, our North Texas riders. So thank you all for participating today. We do have a few more minutes here. We're gonna get a couple more questions in. This one's from Joey. And Joey, thank you for asking this. How is the remodeling process affecting the progress and implementation of DART's master plan? And Rob, I'll throw it to you. Not, yeah, and I, I, I'm, I'm not completely sure. Uh, I know exactly how to answer that because we have several master plans, but I'll take a shot at it. The way we have several different efforts that are going on in parallel, and we're not stopping everything else that we're doing uh, to focus just on this project. We have teams within DART that are working on the development of the Silver Line Rail project. We have other team working on the D2 subway project in downtown Dallas and the planning and uh, development work for that. We also are doing platform extensions at rail stations. That construction is underway now so that we can run three car trains and increase our capacity on the red blue and orange lines over time. And so there are a number of different projects going on and they're gonna to continue to go on at the same time that we're working on this bus network redesign. Thank you, Rob, I appreciate it. And Lawrence, I have a question for you here. How are you getting input from lower income riders, uh, refugee immigrant communities who would benefit from a better, a better bus network and then also, how how those responses been so far? Well, as we said earlier, we identified <clears throat> and um, uh, taken approaches to get input from various groups, uh, lower income and and different uh, ethnicities, if you will. So um, the input that we've gotten thus far is is somewhat similar to what the general uh, bus riding population have have. Uh, have forwarded it thus far. You know, it's questions about why is this route operating this way? Um, we're still getting this input. Uh, I know when we had one of the town halls, we had uh, the Spanish town hall, we had over 75 responses um, for that, although that's not necessarily uh, identified with low income, but that's a different language just to let you know that level of participation that we experienced for that. So. Uh, we're still getting uh, input. We still look forward to getting more input. We have a team that's looking at ways to um, penetrate uh, these various markets, and we will be getting the input throughout the remaining phases of the project. Awesome. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, oh, go ahead, Michelle. I have the latest numbers um, that Lawrence hasn't had a chance to see yet since last week. We've got two surveys open. One is in English and one is in Spanish. And actually our whole website is available in Spanish if people prefer it that way. Um, <clears throat> and the Spanish language site, we've got almost 80, 80 responses. In the English survey, we've got almost 400 responses. Um, we have also on our team, we have some local outreach professionals and they have been doing some pretty uh, direct individual outreach, um, calling social service organizations, calling groups that work with um, minority people, lower income people, refugees, and encouraging people to take the survey. And even to the point of just helping people take the survey over the phone, like helping them find the website, talking them through any questions that they have. Um, so that is helping us reach a more diverse group. But what we'd also like to do that we can't quite do yet is actually get out onto the platforms and into the transit centers and do some surveying in person. That's not something we're gonna do yet because of COVID, but we do plan to do it once, once we are sure we can do that, keep our surveyors safe. And also once we're sure that people on the platforms, people who are riding, um, are open to that, are open to having a conversation with a stranger, you know, from 
at least six feet away um, to, to take a survey. So that's in the plan, but we've had to put it on hold for obvious reasons. Um, finally, I'll just remind everyone, I said it earlier, that we are going to keep the survey open through June 14th. That's uh, was Lawrence that said that. Um, and we're going to be advertising it on board buses. So if anyone's riding the buses in early June and you see an ad for Dart Zoom, that's what it's about. We want to make sure to get existing riders um, because their input is really important in this process. Uh, Lawrence and Michelle, thank you all very much. What a what a great response to that question, and I just can't I can't plug it enough, emphasize it enough. Uh, please go to our website, dartzoom.org. It is available, like Michelle said, in English and Spanish. So we would love to get your responses, your input uh, on what we're doing for the North Texas community. It is your network, and we would really, really love to hear what you have to say, your thoughts on it as we design this network for the future. Got a great question here from Joey on Facebook. It seems to me that DART buses service many common destinations, but how do you gauge and route those buses according to starting points? Do you start in residential areas? How does that work? And, and uh, Rob or Michelle, please field that question. Ooh, let me. This is a really <laughs> question and I love it. Joey, maybe you should be a service planner. Um, that's a great question. How do you design what, how do you decide what route a bus should take? Sometimes if you just try to connect all the big places, the busy places, your bus route ends up being like spaghetti and people do not like riding through spaghetti. People like riding fairly direct to where they're going. Um, so the trick of it, the art of it is to run bus routes that are as linear as you can make them, yet they get pretty close to the busy places like the hospitals and the schools and the apartment buildings um, and the business districts. Um, this is easier when you're working in a place where all of those busy places are on the road. They're like on the main road so you can just run your bus down the main road and when it stops there's the Walmart and then it stops and there's the hospital. It's much harder when those busy places are set away from the main road. Maybe they're down a long, long, long driveway. Maybe they're down a cul-de-sac. Maybe they're even on off a freeway ramp. Now it's very hard to have your bus route be straight and yet also drop people off close to their destinations. Um, so sometimes that forces us to either draw a bus route that's kind of squiggly um, or not get close to a place that seems important. Um, so that can be very challenging and it is a particular challenge of the North Texas area because a lot of the development in the North Texas area isn't on the main roads or it's not close to the main roads. It's, it's off, it's down a cul-de-sac or it's on the other side of the freeway. Um, the other question you asked is where do you start a bus route or end it? It is definitely good to end bus routes at busy places like a hospital or a university uh, or a transit center. Um, as Rob said, there are a lot of important connections that get made between bus lines, not just between bus and rail. 70 something percent of uh, DART transit trips involve at least one bus line and a lot of them involve two bus lines. And so connecting bus routes to each other is really important. And um, so you often end a bus route at a transit center so that you can time all the bus routes, all the buses to get there at the same time and people can change among them and then they can all drive away again. Or maybe most of them can do that timing. Um, but that way your buses are pretty full right up to the end of the line. And also you're ending the route at a place where people can access lots of other opportunities to travel. Great question. Thank you, Michelle. And I wanna to get to these last two questions and then give the panel, uh, I wanna give everybody a time to wrap up. So we're gonna ask these questions here. Um, and if you could just keep your uh, answers brief with these. Uh, we will go ahead and get to, to final thoughts as well. This one's from Stuart. Uh, will DART ever extend its hours, especially on the weekend, once nightlife is back to or back in full swing to assist those who would like to visit downtown? Rob, I guess that'd be a question for you there. We've been asked about that by several different people during the course of our public input. And that's something that we'll take in and discuss. Uh, DART currently, as you probably know, runs until about 12.20 a.m. or so with the last trains and buses leaving downtown, uh, but we'll con consider that during the course of the study. And I'd like to tag on to that. Night service is important for people who want to go downtown and have a good time, definitely, but don't forget, 
whenever you leave the bar, the people who work at the bar, they leave an hour later. So night service is crucial for workers. And really that's why it's good for high ridership. And it's also good socially, um, is it helps people who work at all those recreation facilities, all those bars and restaurants, it helps them also get home from work late at night. Fantastic, thank you all. Last question here, and this one's from Andrew. Will this redesign have alternatives to its routes that take into account the removal of I-345 and or any connections to uh, high-speed rail that might happen within the next 10 years? Well, we're designing for the year 2022 right now. So um, I think the easy answer is, is no, because we are, that's what we're focused on. This is not a long-term plan, but certainly as we're designing for 2022, I expect there to be conversations about, okay, so how, how would this change once, you know, these other longer term changes have happened? How would we take advantage of those or make it work with those? Rob, do you have anything to add? Well, we've actually made a couple of bus changes in the last couple of years that anticipate the possibility of a high-speed rail terminal on the southern edge of downtown Dallas, and we're ready to be able to tap into that should that happen down the road. Fantastic. Thank you all very much. Uh, it's 12.52. we got about eight minutes left into this Facebook Live event. If you have additional questions, of course, you can go to serviceplanning at dart.org to ask your questions there. Please go to our website, dartzoom.org. I want to give the panel each a uh, couple of uh, minutes here to, to give some final thoughts. Lawrence, I want to start with you. Do you have any final thoughts for us today? Yes, uh, just generally speaking, to reiterate some points that have already been made, we want um, participants to do three main things. We want them to learn more, and they can learn more by viewing the network concept that's on the, uh, that can be accessed through the uh, through the Dart Zoom uh, page. You can see the schedule of events that are upcoming. You can uh, sign up for emails. That's what you do when you, learn, when you learn more. You can also give input. You can take the online survey, which is something we've all encouraged thus far. You can join an online webinar, or you can participate in the telephone town hall. Lastly, uh, we want you to share with others. We want you to find videos. Uh, articles and reports to share, and you can also request a community participation uh, presentation. I'm sorry. So um, look at all these options and please uh, participate and encourage others that you know, uh, even people who are non writers to participate as much uh, as you can verbally. And I think um, they'll be surprised when they access the information that's available, uh, what they might get out of it and how they can continue to participate. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Michelle, I want to go to you next. Thank you. In closing, I'd like to. I think, Michelle, you went on mute there. My power flickered off for a second. <laughs> okay. Uh, in closing, I just want to say that uh, this question we're asking people right now in this phase of the project, there's no technically correct answer. There's not even a morally correct answer. You know, whether DART should take its limited budget and focus on high ridership lines to serve the greatest number of people, or whether DART should take its limited budget and spread service around to get close to the greatest number of people, even though fewer of them will actually ride, there's no technically correct answer. I, as a national expert, can't tell you what to do. I'm not gonna tell DART what to do. My opinion is irrelevant. Um, what's really relevant is your opinion, you, the bus rider, the public, the sales taxpayer, the stakeholder, the resident of these 13 cities, the worker. Um, so your opinion about how to balance these two goals matters a lot. And ultimately the DART board is gonna to have to make a difficult trade-off here, just like our school boards make difficult trade-offs and our city councils make difficult trade-offs about how to spend limited budgets towards different goals. This is one of those. So please help them make a good decision, even though it's a hard decision, and you can help them by taking the survey. And as Lawrence said, by sharing information about this survey with other people whose opinions uh, also matter. So thank you so much for joining us today, everybody. Thank you, Michelle. And Rob, we have just a couple of minutes left. I will uh, give them to you. 
And thanks, Ralph. And just to, to reiterate, I think what everyone else is saying, we really want to hear from people. It's hard right now. People are working from home. They're not going out. They're not riding perhaps like they normally do. And I'm hoping that at some point during the course of this process, we'll be able to talk to people person to person. Uh, but we do want to offer the ability to reach out to us through the email address, to talk directly to the DART service planning staff and other people within DART about issues that we're dealing with, either things we're dealing with now or what we do as we take this project forward. And we're going to continue to look for ways to get uh, your input and to talk to people as we go through the course of this study. Thanks to everyone who has been participating in these events so far, and hopefully we'll be able to do more of them in the near future. Absolutely, thank you, Rob. Our panelists today was Rob Smith with DART Service Planning and Scheduling, Lawrence Meshack uh, with DART Media Affairs, and Michelle Pyro with Jarrett Walker and Associates. Thank you all again very much for being on our panel today, DART's Facebook Live. I would like to thank everyone that was uh, in attendance for Facebook Live today. That was fantastic. Thank you all for your questions. I apologize if we didn't get to them all, but you can always continue to ask your questions at serviceplanning at dart.org. If you haven't taken, taken the survey, please go to dartzoom.org, tell your friends, tell everyone, stay safe out there, and uh, thank you all very much. Bye. Bye. -bye.